Hello, welcome to our program, Your Right to Know, Our Pleasure to Tell. I am Malaika Muffet. Over the last few weeks, you've been given an in-depth look in the achievements of the United Progressive Party government under the esteemed leadership of Dr. Winston Baldwin Spencer from 2004 to 2014. Each minister that we continuously have these discussions with highlight their achievements in each ministry. As you continue to tune into our program, we trust that you would enjoy, you would be educated, you would be empowered, and also feel proud of your nation of Antigua and Barbuda because it is indeed your right to know, and these ministers, it is their pleasure to tell. So stay tuned as we speak tonight with Honorable John McGinley, and he's the Minister of Tourism and Civil Aviation. Stay tuned. Honorable John McGinley, Minister of Tourism and Civil Aviation, welcome to Your Right to Know, our pleasure to tell. Thank you and good morning and pleasure to be here with you this morning. Thank you. Why don't we make our conversation a little more specific? What is your main role as Minister of Tourism? Um, the Ministry of Tourism is a, a large ministry, um, giving me the responsibility for uh, all arrivals into Antigua, the experiences mm -hmm. that they have here. And we like to look at it in, a, in a, sort of an overall view of um, making sure that anybody who visits Antigua um, has a wonderful experience. And, and um, we, we have to make sure from their arrival to everything that happens inland to their departure um, goes um, to meet their expectation. I think that is probably the, the easiest way to to say it is to try and make sure that we meet each person's individual expectation of their visit to Antigua. Excellent. Uh, civil aviation, for those at home of our viewing audience and those listening, can you expand a little bit on civil, civil aviation? Well, civil aviation refers to um, the airlines and the airport, um, regulatory um, requirements for Antigua and Barbuda, so the mm -hmm. Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Authority. Uh, we work making sure that we meet all the international regulations. Mm -hmm. So the airport comes under um, my ministry, the airport uh, authority, which is a statutory body. But we're responsible for oversight, security, and making sure that everything at the airport uh, uh, works well and meets, again, the expectations of all our travelers, the airlines, the regulatory bodies, to ensure that Antigua and, and our airports form part of the international family. Okay. Is it fair to say that tourism is the backbone of Antigua and Barbuda? Yes, and, and uh, tourism-related things uh, are so important to, to our economy. Yes. Um, you know, you hear economists talking about 70 to 75 percent of our gross domestic product is derived from tourism or tourism-related um, entities and, mm. and, and so forth. Now, some people say, well, hotels are only a small part. But, you know, uh, during some of our consultations, you know, we like to say, listen, here is a situation. A hotel worker gets his salary or yes. her salary, and they go to a car dealer to buy a car. Now, the money being spent to buy the car is from the hotel industry. Mm -hmm. Or if they, that person goes to the bank and borrows money, the money used to pay the loan to buy the car is derived from the tourism industry. Truckers mm -hmm. taking things from the port to the hotel, and the truckers mm -hmm. are part of the tourism industry. So we, we, we make people understand that tourism is the driver, and there are many other supporting um, industries around tourism that plays a very important part in how we continue to um, develop our, our, our economy in Antigua, and tourism forms sort of the, the core, the backbone. And uh, recently, what has happened, you know, you, you, you're hearing mixed things about our tourism, tourism. All our tourism numbers are up. We're doing much better today than we were doing, say, five years ago. Okay. But the, the challenge we have is, is that um, in 2009, for instance, we lost the Stanford Empire. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, different numbers, they say over a thousand people lost their jobs in a couple of weeks. But then you also had all the, the, the companies that supplied all the Stanford thing, the Stanford um, Empire. So it could have been three or 4,000 people. Well, where did those people go? Most of them have been absorbed in the tourism industry. 
Okay. So that it, the tourism industry is now, or tourism product is being asked to carry a much larger burden today yes. than it did during the Stanford time. You know, you touched a little bit on that question with regards to the slump in our economy. Um, what did the United Progressive Party government do to relieve Antigua and Barbuda from that slump? Well, I, I don't know if we were able to relieve, but we mm -hmm. had to. We are part of a global economy, mm -hmm. and when you had the financial crisis and uh, the U.S. economy and the British and the, the German and the European economies and all our source markets yes. had a, a, a downturn, people stopped traveling. And those who did travel, um, traveled for shorter periods of time and spent less money. Mm -hmm. So we, we have this, this, um, this challenge all the time where people focus on arrivals, uh, how many people come to your island. That's just one measure. You can have the same amount of arrivals or 10% more, and they spend 20% less. Are you better off? No, you yes. aren't. So it's that combination of uh, maintaining uh, a satisfactory number of people but that they stay long and they spend money. Yeah. What we as the United Progressive Party um, stepped out to do as part of our tourism policy is to make sure that we maintain the numbers that we have. And in 2009, we had about 250, 260,000 stayover passengers. And today we're still at that level. Okay. But to ensure that we got those persons to come and spend some more money and stay a little longer. And those were the the, the, the real policy goals, and we, we did various things to try and make sure that that happened. Okay, touching a little bit more on tourism and entrepreneurship, what has been the benefits with tourism and maintaining that stance of, that the United Progressive Party has maintained um, with regards to tourism, but how has it benefited young entrepreneurs throughout the island of Antigua and Barbuda? That's, that's a very good question. and. Entrepreneurship is a challenge everywhere. Mm -hmm. and young people come up with new ideas, um, internet-based product. You, you see a lot of that being developed now. People advertising through websites and Facebook and social media. Mm -hmm. uh, you're seeing young people coming up with new ideas about how to promote things. Um, new tours. We've had a you know people come in and say, well, how do, what can I provide for a visitor that will enhance their experience enough? Mm -hmm that they would pay me for it. Yeah. So young people are doing different things. You've seen things like Segway rides and, um, well, they're, they're the established one, the swim, the stingray, the zip line, these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But even within those um, product offerings, they're developing new things, yeah, you know, new ways of encouraging people. Um, and, and, and I'll give you one. Cruise ships, for mm -hmm. instance, and the, and the crews that we have some responsibility for too. Um, they sell packages on the boat, on, on the ship. So they might sell a package on the ship for $100. Young Antiguans are going to the, the, the providers of these stores and saying, listen, can you sell it to me for $80? Okay. And then they advertise online on the boat and sell it for $90 Today. and actually compete with the cruise lines via the internet to try and capture those cruise passengers mm -hmm. um, that they would not normally have had an opportunity to speak to. But through the, the internet and social media, they can now promote themselves to all the people visiting Antigua and the cruise lines on a cruise ship, where in the past they weren't able to do that because mm -hmm. you had to physically talk to somebody and put a piece of paper in their hands. Now they don't have to do that. They can go online. So somebody who is on a, on a, a cruise in the Caribbean, they would go, well, where are the five destinations that I'm going? And they can search for things to do. And then they can say, well, listen, if I buy this tour on the boat, it's $120. But look, um, a young Antiguan entrepreneur is offering the same exact tour mm -hmm. at the same time for $100. And then they will book it online. So you, you see some of that coming in where um, some entrepreneurs are doing something. So they might not have a, a physical brick and mortar place, yes. but they're operating um, on the internet. That's excellent. As Minister of Tourism, um, what are the five most significant achievements of the United Progressive Party government? Um, I think the first one is responding to how you promote Antigua yes. and Barbuda into, in the world today. Uh, when I became minister five years ago, you were just seeing that change to social media and internet promotion and what we call the digital platform. Mm -hmm. And um, 2009, you had the downturn. We didn't have enough. We didn't have as much money to, to go 
into the source markets and market. You know, mm -hmm. we, we had offices in Italy, France, Germany, and each office needed staff. Each office needed printed material in their language. It, 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 just very burdensome and very cost, um, not cost effective. So we brought in some consultants and we said, listen, we want to compete on the digital world. How do we present Antigua um, on this digital platform that not only competed with Caribbean islands, but the entire world? Mm -hmm. So we created visitantiguabarbuda.com, which is our digital platform. And we also have a Facebook page and an Instagram page, and we're doing Twitter, Flickr, um, Snapchat, all these new social media things. And it, it is now created an opportunity for us to promote Antigua, brand Antigua and Barbuda, yes. throughout the world all the time. And, and you know, I, I, I try to explain that change to people who are accustomed to getting a magazine or getting a flyer. Um, on our Facebook page, we've now, when we, when, when we took it over, we had 6,000 um, persons liking our page. We're up to nearly 50,000 now in wow. less than a year. Now, yes. people say, well, is that where you want to be? No, we want to get up to 150, 200,000 yes. eventually. But just, to, just so people understand the reach, we posted, uh, uh, reposted an article from the Daily Mail in London. Uh, an English comedian traveled through the Caribbean and wrote a piece on his two favorite places, British Virgin Islands and Antigua. Okay. We reposted that, and within 24 hours, over 50,000 people, wow. unique likes, unique views had seen that. Um, we, we, had, we reposted also a picture from Barbuda, a, a pink sand beach. And we reposted it on our site, mm -hmm. saying, look, here's Antigua and Barbuda. Uh, within 48 hours, over 100,000 people had wow. seen that. Now, I, I try to say to people, if we had to put a picture of Antigua in 100,000 people's hands, mm -hmm. unique people, to show them that, so that we know that we can count that 100,000 persons are, that would cost us a lot of money. But we're doing that every day. Now, four times a day, we have a new post on Instagram. On the Facebook page, they're posting things every day. And um, we're beginning to build brand Antigua again digitally all around the place. We still have to do the brick and mortar thing. Yeah. We still have to go to um, you know, trade shows and we still have to go and meet travel agents. But instead of now going with a whole box of paper, yeah. we go with the website. And we go to our Facebook page and we say, listen, any information you want about Antigua, here it is in real time. You don't have to write us and wait for us to respond. It, it's right there. You go and visit AntiguaBarbuda.com, for instance, there's an there's a, a, a active Google Earth map that is embedded in our site. Okay. And we're slowly building that out. Um, the site now has nearly 60,000 words and lots of video and things. And it's going to take some time to build it up to where we want it to get, but it's going. But if you go on the, the Google Earth map, you can go to historical sites and it will show you Betty Soap. And you can click on Betty Soap and a little sub-menu will drop down about the history of Betty Soap. Mm -hmm. The museum is working with us now to continue to fill out um, that information about Betty Soap. So if you are a history buff and you really wanted to delve deeper into Betty Soap, the museum is giving it information. But we're also, you can also embed video in there so okay. people can take you. And while I'm on Betty's Hope, um, to show you how we continue to build it, we have started a, a project with um, a group in Antigua, an archaeological group in the UK, to rebuild two of our locomotive engines. You know, during the sugar time, we used to have train tracks all around Antigua, yeah. and it, it, the trains used to pull the cane. As a little boy, I remember them. I'm sort of dating myself, but I remember them. Well. <laughs> We went and found them. They were abandoned all over the place, lying in the bush, all rusted up. Well, we got, we eventually got all of them that we could find, mm -hmm. put them down. The group from the UK came and said, listen, we have enough here to build two for you, and we will take the rest to help us. So they're doing it for free. One is almost completed, mm -hmm. and our plan is to, at Betty's Hope, build a little train track up there and put the locomotive back there so that it will... You know, people can come and yes. actually take. Yeah. We might not really use the, the locomotive engine. We might put a little electric engine there to make it run around. Yes. But at least we build it as part of our history. And these are things that we, we're wanting to do. The, 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 the whole thing about that is, is that we have a lot of stories to tell in Antigua. Uh, you ever heard of the pain tree? The pain tree? The pain tree. No, if I've you talk to old the people, they tell you that there's this, this tree up by North Sound. 
that okay. when you have an, aff uh, an affliction or you're sick with something, you would go to the tree, you'd put it on a piece of paper and nail it on, and then you turn your back and you walk away, you never look at it again, and somehow <laughs> you get healthy. But these are all myths about yes. Antigua, Devil's Bridge. I yes. mean, if you ask um, 10 taxi drivers or 10 young people in this room, what's the myth about um, Devil's, Devil's Bridge? Bridge? Each one of them will tell you a different story. I mean, mm -hmm. I heard one that if you drop two eggs, one will disappear and one will come back up <laughs> boiled, you know? So, but you hear all these myths and people will yes. pay to hear those myths. Mm -hmm. So we put Betty's Hope on the map. You can, and it's a, it, it has a map on it, an active map, so you can see how to get there. Okay. And once you get there, it'll tell you the myths about Betty's Hope and what the slaves used to do. Mm -hmm. So it's telling our story. Yes. Basically what we're trying to do is create a platform so that we can tell our story to everybody in the world on one platform so that people can see and understand what it is. And of course, the, the, the platform also has all the hotels, all the airlines, there's a booking feature, yes. all the modern bell, bells and whistles that you will find in the destination site mm -hmm. um, that will allow you to say if you're in Italy you, and, and you're in Milan and you say, well, how do I get to Antigua? You put it in the search box and it will tell you every airline and how you get there and quote. Mm -hmm. And you can book right there. You can book your hotel. And eventually, we want you to be able to book your restaurant um, reservation. So there's an itinerary planner on there. And before you leave home, you can know what you're doing in Antigua. If you're going to have a cruise with Wadadli Cruises or you're going to swim at the yes. Stingrays, you can pre-book all of that. Set your schedule up so when you arrive, you know what, what you're going to do. That is major, major, or I should say those are significant achievements. Maybe you have about two more to yes, mention. Yes, absolutely. So we, we have the digital platform, yes. service. The it service excellence program. arena? Program, absolutely. Okay. And, and that is so important. Um, when I became minister, and Minister Lovell and I met when, when we were talking, he says, one of the biggest challenges we have is the airport on a Saturday, mm -hmm. uh, customs and immigration. Yeah? Now, I went up there and I was, uh, I was very upset at first at what was going on and so on. Then I realized, listen, that isn't a bad problem to have. The, the fact is that there are many, many people arriving at the airport on Saturday afternoon. Yes. Yeah, that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. What we need to do is make sure we take care of them when they arrive. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've worked very closely with customs and immigration to provide them better tools, um, more training, more talks about the importance of how quickly you can get somebody through. Um, the importance of saying hello, welcome to Antigua. Just, mm -hmm. you know, not, not being surly necessarily. Antiguans are wonderful people, you know, but we have a we have a way sometimes of being very stern in appearance, mm -hmm. you know. But once you get by that sternness, Antiguans are very jovial and very and I, I fun people. And I try to say to the immigration officers, listen, just be like that. You know, you know, you know, somebody comes off an eight-hour plane. They've been cramped up for eight hours in a little sardine can, you know. Yes. When they come off, they want to see a smiling face. They're not asking you anything. They say, welcome to Antigua. Yes. You know, and you can do the same thing. I used to get very stern letters about how difficult they were. Today, I am getting people right in saying that they're experienced with immigration and customs yeah. much, much better. And th that means we are getting better. Are we perfect? Absolutely not. Yeah. Yeah. Can we still get better? Absolutely. But I really have to take my hands off to Colonel Walker and Mr. Baju, Raju and his team for trying to get them to understand the, the issue of customer service. Um, every year now we have our tourism awards. Our hotels provide wonderful service. The challenge we have is, does that service level meet our expectations once you step out of the hotel? Mm -hmm. uh, two stories that I, I will tell very quickly. There was a lady that came to Antigua for five days. Yeah. She made a reservation to get her hair done on the third day. Yeah? Her appointment was from for 11 o'clock in town, and she was at St. James's Club. Okay. She took a taxi at 9 o'clock, came into town, because she didn't know where the salon was and so on. She arrived at the salon at quarter to 11. She says, I'm here for my um, appointment. The lady said, sit. At one o'clock, they called her back. So at three o'clock, she's finished. She gets back to St. James's Club at four o'clock. So 20% of her entire time in Antigua was spent almost sitting in a beauty salon waiting to get her hair done for dinner. And she was so upset because the reason she made the appointment, because she wanted to do something at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. She'd come at 11, get her hair done by 12, get back yeah. to St. James's Club, spend the afternoon. It destroyed her whole day. Yeah. 
-hmm. And those are the kinds of things that the, you know, other um, suppliers in the industry have to understand. So we now recognize people outside of the hotel plant. Yes. So last year we recognized a um, gas station attendant. We gave Percival Service Station an award for exemplary service because um, when you go there, everybody's properly uniformed. Mm -hmm. They're very polite. The place is clean and nice. We want to recognize people for the provision of service, and we, we're continuing to do that. Um, in, within the ministry, we get offers all the time to expand people's horizon in training. Mm -hmm. So um, we've sent people to Japan for three months, over and over. Every time it comes up, I said, look, you, you guys go learn, see what is going on out there. So when you come back and you talk, you can speak to what is happening in the real world. Um, the taxi drivers, we, we, we need to continue development. We have new arrangements with them. They, mm -hmm. They know our grandfathering in new things that they're, you know, like seat belts in the back seat. Everybody has a fire extinguisher. Everybody has a work and air conditioned unit. Those mm -hmm. are things that take time. But if you keep explaining to them the importance of their role as part of this whole thing we call tourism, it works. So service excellence, very mm -hmm. important. Building brand Antigua. Uh, the, other, the other issue that we've maintained is the issue of security. Yes. Um, there's always that issue. When I became minister first, we just had some horrible things happen. The first two times I went to the U.S. and England, 99% of the questions are about security. Mm -hmm. Now I go back, the, the question is, well, you know, the taxi driver's cars are too dirty. And I smile. <laughs> I say, well, you know, it has changed. The complexion has changed. Yeah. And we, we continue to, to see that being reflected in the awards that we win. Um, Caribbean Destination for Weddings. Um, Travelocity is um, TripAdvisor has mm -hmm. given us awards again about service and, and productivity and so. So we need to continue that. It, it, it never ends. We need to continue. So that is very important. Um, service excellence as well. Um, cleanliness. We we have to continue to work with civic pride and get an Antiguans to understand the importance of keeping Antigua clean mm -hmm. for Antiguans first. Yes. And also for people who visit. We live in a very different world today. I mean, you now get certifications for environmental things, Green Globe certification, and people are actually making their reservations based on your involvement in environmental safety and, mm. and, and these kinds of things. Do you recycle your water? All these kinds of things are, are, are things that people make decisions on where to travel. Yeah. So we need to continue that. Um, I, as I campaign day to day, and even in my travels as a, as a minister of tourism, you keep hearing this. Why are the sides of the road so dirty? Now, we've in, introduced this program of maintaining the sides of the roads where we can to keep them clean. and so. Mm -hmm. But what happens then is as soon as somebody throws something out the car, it's very visible. There's no bush anymore to hide it. Yes. So we have to continue telling people the importance of a clean and serene environment. Um, our offshore islands, the waters around, how we... Um, treat with those, uh, the pristine nature. Sailing is one of the biggest sports in Antigua, known internationally. Nobody's going to come and sail here if the waters are filthy. So we need to continue to maintain those things and be very vigil and, and make sure that our environmental, um, our, our position environmentally and cleanliness and these kinds of things are maintained. And that we have standards. Yeah. We've, um, I've been able to just recently um, not just recently, but eight years of work. I've got the, the Caribbean Public Health Agency and the Caribbean Tourism Association um, are now doing uh, a tourism and health program that I've been very involved in, in starting. And I would invite um, viewers to go to the Caribbean Public Health Agency website mm -hmm. or the Caribbean Tourism Organization website and look under the tourism and health program. Because my feeling has always been is that we need a Caribbean standard. Mm -hmm for all levels of things in tourism and health. So um, food safety in a hotel. Now, each hotel has a different standard. Yeah. Some are English-based, some are American-based, and they're different. Why not have one standard that all of us in Antigua um, agree to on the Caribbean and say, listen, this is our standard of um, food safety that we demand in a restaurant and a hotel, that once you see that tag, everybody knows that you you're HACCP certified, that you, you do all the things that are required to make your 
establishment safety. So certification and standards and so are very, very important. Mr. Minister, we've spoken a lot about tourism. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about family. I know that you well, your viewers also know that you're a family individual mm -hmm. um, and you're running in this year's 2014 election. How have you been able to balance all the responsibilities, your previous duties, those that you have on your plate today and still manage family? Well, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, depending on who you talk to, some of us have not been as successful as others. <laughs> Um, but um, I have two wonderful children. Mm -hmm. um, they're now teenagers, and mm -hmm. I try my best every day to spend some time with them. My son is in university now, uh, following in my footsteps, I'm happy to say, and, uh, on a tennis scholarship and doing oh, very, very well. And uh, uh, more important for me, he's doing well in school, mm -hmm. and he's very socially minded. He's part of a group called Project Sync, a group of his classmates at grammar school got together and said, listen, how can we, meld, how can we um, put party in and community service together? <laughs> so they formed a group Project called Sync. Project Sync, okay, and they have, they have parties, okay. and they raise money. They don't make the money for themselves. Whatever money they make, they do, donate to a charity. Okay. So it's very, interest, very interesting to see 16 and 17-year-olds. Well, they're now 18 and 19. Mm -hmm. They're all off in college, and they're still doing... Um, this community service and is um, there are five or six young men and I think there's one lady in the group now and this summer they're coming together to have a party to raise money for breast cancer yes. and every time I think about it I say hold on here are 18 and 19 year old boys yes. having a party and uh, prepared to raise money for um, a women's yes. issue yes. which yes. yeah and they understand the importance and one of them said to me listen all of us have mothers mm -hmm. and I said guys you're, you're, you're thinking way beyond your years, which is wonderful. Yes. But they're coming together to, 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 to raise funds through party because they're going to have a fit. <laughs> yeah. yes. And enjoy themselves. Yes. But then at the end of it, whatever it profits they make, goes. they yes. give it to um, breast cancer. And I think they're going to have some big announcements to make. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've been able to introduce them to some players that uh, will make the contribution much better, but, it, yes. but it's their thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and my daughter's a swimmer. She swims okay. for Antigua um, and enjoys it. Uh, to, be, to be a swimmer, the discipline, and they have a whole group of them. Uh, mm -hmm. She's the captain of her swim team. Mr. Minister, we've spoken so much about tourism, and I'm happy to be sitting in front of a proud papa, <laughs> but let's talk a little bit about civil aviation and the new airport project. Yes, I'm um, very excited. I went, um, the Prime Minister and I had a tour with the Chinese uh, just last week, mm -hmm. actually, of the new airport facility. And, you know, I've been involved from the start. and I've seen the drawings. I've been through all the, the things on, on, on paper. Yes. Um, I must admit that I don't do things in three dimension from paper very well. <laughs> so I couldn't really picture what was happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, when we went to visit it, last two weeks or so, or last week, and you actually see what is happening in there. What a revolutionary change it's going to be for um, all Antiguans who travel and visitors who come here. Yeah. Um, just to give you an idea, there's, there are 46 CUTE terminals, right? And CUTE stands for Common Use Terminal, I can't remember what the E stands for, <laughs> but uh, Common Use Terminals is what it is. Yeah. And what that allows you to do in, in, in this world is that, say, say Virgin is checking in. Mm -hmm. Instead of Virgin having four or five fixed terminals, they could use 20 terminals to check in everybody all at once. Any oh. 20. Yeah. Because it's all digital. And they're all, will send the same unit. So if Liat has two flights to do, instead of Liat having three counters fixed, they could use 10 if they have 10 agents. Mm -hmm. And then once they finish with the flight, they pack up and they move. So there's no fixed. Um, yeah. Terminals like you have at, at VC Bird today. That's why it's called cute common use um, terminal, whatever it is. <laughs> um, I will let the yes. experts. I I just know what it's it's for. Mm -hmm. But then you walk into the back, and they explain to us the way the terminal is, is built is you build the baggage compartments first, the, the things to handle the baggage, and you build the airport around. So mm -hmm. there are four conveyor belts that are built into the, the airport. So as soon as you take your bag and you put it behind you, it automatically goes in a belt and it's viewed um, electronically. There's a scanner mm -hmm. that makes a decision whether the bag needs to be searched, 
it's questionable or it's good. If it's good, it kicks off into one chute and it goes straight out to your, wherever the plane, whoever's packing that plane, mm -hmm. it goes straight to them and they take it and put it in the bag. Okay. If it's a questionable bag, it goes to a secondary area and they have a look at it again. Mm -hmm. If at that point they say it's good, it kicks back in and it goes. If it isn't good and they say, well, listen, this is a questionable bag, it kicks out and then the only time somebody looks at it is if it fails stage two. But okay. everything is on remote now, it, it, it goes around. Um, so the issues, the issues that we have today with bags and where they go and people pulling them in carts and so, it's not going to happen. And then at the back of the airport now, the luggage carts come in, all inside, they load up, shut the container and it goes out. So your bags no longer go in the rain on the way out and these kinds of things. You know, mm -hmm. people complain mm -hmm. that on the few days it rains in Antigua, their bags get wet. So you, you don't have that. But it's, it's an automated system now. Um, in Jamaica, for instance, at Kingston Airport, there are two um, shoots. We have four. So we have two redundant. The redundancy is doubled. So if one breaks down, you have a second yes, one. Yeah. That one breaks down, you still have two more. Yeah. And all of them move independently. Um, there are, there's a new immigration hall. Uh, the hall for immigration, it's a, by itself now. All inside, much bigger, more mm -hmm. terminals. And then you leave the immigration hall, you're going to customs. Uh, uh, again, there are four conveyor belts in customs. Four belts. At Coolidge now we have two. The f n all four of the belts that we have in the new airport are bigger than any two of the two that we have in VC Bird. So it, it's grown in, in size uh, and capacity. The view is it can handle 1,800 passengers an hour. 1,800 1, passengers, passengers an hour. So okay. it's really, you know, there are escalators and elevators going from one floor to the next. So every time you change floors, uh, there are steps, there's an escalator, and there's an elevator. So they're looking to make sure that persons with disabilities have access um, both ways. We now have four fingers, so planes. Well, as soon as maybe next week, next month, sometime next month, planes will start um, parking nose in and be backed up with tugs. So that, you know, right now the planes park sideways and it takes up a lot of space. Now they're going to be pointing nose in like mm -hmm. most... Um, airports around the world now that they come nosing and they back you out. So there'll be four fingers and then other fuel pits for, for other airlines. So um, what is happening now is that Antigua's airport is moving into, um, will be probably the most modern airport in the Caribbean mm -hmm. um, once it's open. We've done all the work on the, the runway. We've uh, put in new fuel lines. So this issue of trucking gas to planes now okay. will be reduced. I don't think it will go away altogether. You mm -hmm. must always have a redundancy, but in most cases, um, the fuel will come from underground and, and just popped into, into the plane. Mm -hmm. um, people now with the bigger planes will go through fingers, you know, the air bridges and in like modern airports. So very exciting time. Um, that airport construction will finish at the end of September. And once that is finished, then all the processes of making it work will have to start. So we have to have ECA inspections, uh, Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Authority inspection, okay. the TSA, the Transport Safety Administration of the U.S., the British Border Protection. All these people will have to come mm -hmm. down mm -hmm. and visit and make sure, yes, you say that this thing works this way, let's sign off and check it. So um, all those checks will have to be done. And, and we're expecting, our goal is by December, December to have the airport. 2014 to have it fully operational. Okay, it sounds like a very major project and I'm sure with that happening it would increase with regards to employment. How does that play out oh, uh, for the new airport project? Absolutely, they will need more people. It's a bigger place, um, more systems. Um, definitely they will need more persons all around the airport, immigration, customs, mm -hmm. um, um, you know, maintenance and, and all the different things. So there will be a rise in, in employment at, at the airport. What's also important to it, it presents now to our partners, the airlines, with a new option mm -hmm. for Antigua. We've always said that Antigua should be um, the northern hub for the Caribbean so that international airlines can fly in here and then feed out to other places. Well, VC Bird really couldn't handle that. Mm -hmm. our, our little airport here that we built 30 years ago, when that was built, nobody envisioned six, seven, eight wide-body jets on the ground at the same time. Yeah. So that the airlines are going, listen, you can't handle that. We're not going to get involved in that because the, the confusion is created when our planes come in to try and get them off. 
um, is too much. But now, with a new terminal, with a new runway, with new parking facilities, our ability to take care of the passengers is going to be so much better that airlines are starting to say, well, listen, if that new airport is there, you know, we're going to start to look at this northern hub. For instance, British Airways are increasing their airlift into Antigua next year by 6%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Virgin has increased the number of flights they're flying. Um, it, they've reduced the number of seats, but increased, almost tripled the number of seats that they fly in the front, yeah. the first class and premium economy, because that's our client. And mm -hmm. that's the one that really makes the money for the airline. So by building a new terminal now, it's also going to open new opportunities for us in providing for airlines to use VC Bird and Antigua as a hub for in transit and, and, and onward transit to other places. Um, let's talk a little bit about smaller projects that you've been involved in, such as the Cedar, Cedar Grove Clinic, um, the refurbishing of the basketball in York. Can you take a little bit more on that? Ah, constituency matters, I, I, absolutely. Um, you know, infrastructure in the community is very important. Yeah, mm -hmm. There are many issues about being a politician that, that we all have to face. Uh, there are the personal relationships that you have with individuals, mm -hmm. communities, but then there's the infrastructural side. And over the last four or five years, we've been looking at what infrastructural needs are there in the community. And one such um, need was uh, we don't have a major clinic on the north end of the island. Mm -hmm. there's, you know, there's um, Clear Hall Clinic and the, the clinic in town, the medical benefits clinic. But north of that, there, there isn't one. Mm -hmm. We have now built a clinic in Cedar Grove that will have a pharmacy, a creche, a, a, a full clinic. We're also looking at a, a dent, dentistry in there, mm -hmm. an ophthalmology, um, uh, as a possibility in the future. So that people in the north, and we have a lot of retirees, elderly people, young people, that's where we put the creche, mm -hmm. so that single mothers or mothers that want to work and have young children at least can go and leave their kids there during yes. the day and have that opportunity to go and work. Uh, but the pharmacy, um, you know, there are many elderly people in our area that when they have to renew their medical benefits um, prescription, that they got to go into town and fight to find a parking space and get in them big lines. Whereas now with the clinic in, um, that'll be in Cedar Grove, during the day they can come in, there's ample parking, they can drop in, have mm -hmm. a, a checkup mm -hmm. with their doctor who will be there. Um, get their prescription without having that challenge of going into town. So we think that's very important for the north end of the island. It's based in Cedar Grove, mm -hmm. but it, it envisions taking, you know, people all the way from Coolidge all the way over to Millers by the Sea. Okay. St. John's Rural North can all come over to that clinic now um, and have an opportunity to, to get taken care of there instead of fighting in town. What it will also do is alleviate some of the challenges in St. John's as well. Uh, and Clear Hall, take a little strain off of them on the north side. And that's very important. The other important thing that we did recently, too, is we completed a, a bridge in Jabberwock. Okay. Now, wh what has happened there before is that the road became a natural dam for all the water coming from Longfords all the way through um, Royal Gardens, through Hodges Bay. Mm -hmm. And once we had big rains, the water would start backing up all the way and flooding out everybody. Okay. Now that we have allowed access to the sea, the water now has a natural opportunity to get out to the sea and that you don't have as much. You will never stop the flooding because um, there are areas in there that they call dam. That's, the, that's what they call it. The name of the place is dam yeah. because it's just prone to, to flooding. Okay. Yes, but at yes. least by having the bridge, it alleviates the flooding somewhat. And um, last night, I'm very happy to say that the Antigua Barbuda Basketball Association um, started games in the Yorks Community Center again um, okay. through some community help. We've um, resurfaced the basketball court, put new lines, put new nets up and so. And it was a hive of activity down there last night as we got back into this community um, spirit again of having events in there. And, and I want to say this. There's a, many challenges for a representative. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've always been saying and I continue to say, the representative cannot do things by himself, sure. nor does he know what a community needs. Um, that is why this, I've always been saying and trying to help community-based organizations. Mm -hmm. So Yorks, for instance, now, um, after a number of years of 
you know, starting and stopping and starting and stopping. Now have a core community group. Okay. And that community group has been able to say, all right, let's sit and talk about what does this community need. Let's set our priorities once you have that. Then you call people in and say, listen, we would like you to assist us with our needs. Mm -hmm. One of those persons they can reach out to is their representative. So they have reached out to me and said, listen, Mr. Representative, we need some lights on our basketball courts. We had a party. We raised some money. Can you help us by finding some funds somewhere else with somebody to raise some funds? Mm -hmm. That was done. Then we had um, the resurfacing of the basketball court and these things. So one of the things I've said to them, that now that you have this group and that you're working, I'm going to make a donation to you. I built a 40-foot container that I was going to use as my branch office. Okay. All right? Uh, and I, it's fitted out, nice roof, properly, proper building. And next week, I'm going to turn it over to them as their community-based headquarters because mm -hmm. it's through their strength that the community will grow. Instead of waiting on the, the representative to come and say, let's have a basketball tournament. True. Let the community have the basketball tournament. Yes. You call the representative to assist. Mm -hmm. um, that is happening now in, in other areas. Um, uh, the growth of um, neighborhood watch is very, very important. Um, we now have one in Royal Gardens. We now have one in um, McKinnon's. There's one in um, Mount Pleasant. Crosby's just started one. Last Saturday, I met with a group in the Marble Hill area, and we went through the, the genesis of starting that because, you know, crime isn't unique to anywhere into Antigua. There are people that will go around and, and, and do things. Yes. But we need to be vigilant, all of us. And the more eyes you have watching, it's better it is. You know, in Crosby's, for instance, um, we, we, we formed a, uh, a team to name all the streets and put up signs. So now their neighborhood watch can say, listen, I saw a car with no number plates parked on Neem Drive. Does anybody know who it is? Now everybody mm -hmm. who's part of the watch would be aware that there's a, a car with no number plates on Neem Drive. Yeah. So now you can identify uh, the street instead of saying, look, there's a street over there by something. Mm -hmm. They're now named. And the, 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 the Crosby's community have named their streets. So has the Coolidge community. McKinnon's have doing that. Uh, and some of the other, you know, Blue Waters have done that as well. So that you now have these things coming together where you have a neighborhood watch. On social media, if it's WhatsApp or Facebook, they have a, a method of communicating. And people come in and go in and watch it. And all it takes is one um, post to the community group. Listen, yes. um, we, we heard dogs barking in an area or we saw a strange car parked up in such and such an area. And people start, you know, responding to each other. The other thing I've been able to do is connect them to the police. The police mm -hmm. have a community officer that is responsible for community groups. And we've gotten him to come in and meet with them and provide them with numbers because sometimes the only number they have is the police station. Mm -hmm. Well, the community officers have numbers themselves, so you can call them, uh, even if it's for advice, where to go, these kinds of things. And we've taken it a little further. We've worked, Longford's police station is now open as an active police station. Okay. Um, service in the north side of the island. There's still some challenge because they close at nine o'clock at night and I have to, <laughs> you know, I have to say, listen, we got it open, 24 hour police station is still a challenge. They don't mm -hmm. have enough people mm -hmm. and all that sort of stuff. But we're working towards that. Okay. We provided a vehicle um, and slowly get in there. We can see if we can have a second vehicle so they can do patrols. Um, we provided them now with numbers for rapid response so that they, they come in. So these are things that through the strength of community rather than the representative, it gets better. Yeah, And this is what we're, we're trying to make. Um, push in the in the area in, in, in my constituency and, and hopefully all over is that communities come together um, like it was before. I mean, when when I was growing up, we played cricket. You played community. It was Falmouth against English Harbour. You know, um, Cedar Grove against somebody. Mm -hmm. Now you you've seen a splinter of that. You, you know, you're seeing teams coming up rather than communities. But we need to get back to that community because there's strength in community with yeah. everybody watching. Um, Honorable John McGinley, you are Minister of Tourism and Civil Aviation, but you're also an elected member of Parliament. Yes. What are the advantages of that and how has that experience been for you thus far? Well, when you run as a candidate, you're elected to Parliament. So 
I represent St. John's Rural North in the House of Parliament, and my role as a parliamentarian is to pass bills and to change laws and these kinds of things, you know. And there seems to be a disconnect. In, we, we don't talk about what we do in parliament a lot. Yes. Uh, people will say, well, what are your views on these things? I said, well, listen, if you listen to my parliamentary debate, I have it on tape of my views. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to get out there to everybody because the, the vehicle that is developed to represent people is in parliament. Yeah. So um, during the budget presentation, people will pay attention. But when it comes to other acts, sometimes you don't find people spending as much time listening to our parliamentary presentations. Mm -hmm. But that is what an elected representative of the lower house is elected to do, represent people in the House of Parliament. And I'm very proud of my parliamentary record. I've been able to um, table a number of bills in my first term as Minister of Health and now as Minister of Tourism. We've been able to um, debate relevant issues in Antigua and Barbuda of all um, topics, um, whether it's tax, health, um, labor issues, all these kinds of things. But I take Parliament very seriously. And um, I make sure I attend every session. Yeah. I think I've been ill one day or something now, two days out of mm -hmm. the whole parliamentary mm -hmm. session. Mm -hmm. And I attend uh, because that is what I was elected to do. I take it very, very seriously. Yes. I don't um, mess around. I mean, I, I see some of colleagues some in Parliament, representatives come and spend an hour and you don't see them again for the next three days of the parliamentary debate. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. that's what we were elected to do, to go in there and debate. True. And I think it's, it's our, our, as we grow as a, as a country and as a people, more emphasis needs to be spent on what your representative is saying in Parliament, because we're the one who make laws. And mm -hmm. some of my constituents, when we talk, uh, for instance, the Litter Act, when as Minister of Health, I brought an amendment to the Litter Act to Parliament. And one of the things I said is that if we catch you littering, we should find you a thousand dollars. It is that serious that it should be viewed in that manner. Well, my colleagues on both sides said, listen, you cannot be so harsh on a litter act. You can, on, on littering, the fine must be commensurate with the offense. Yeah. And I said, well, I think that offense is big enough that you should charge a thousand dollars if they catch you. And if they catch you three times, they take away your driver's license and these kinds of things. Yeah. Like they do in Bermuda and other places that put an emphasis on clean. Well, the lawyers in particular on both sides of the house said, listen, you can't charge more for throwing a box out the car than you charge for a traffic accident, yeah. which is more serious. I said, but they're all, don't compare them. You should, as far as I'm concerned, you should have it as an offense and littering is important. And terrible. If you go to a beach after a holiday and you see the junk that is left on beaches, Antiguans and people who live here, mm -hmm. you know, they take things to the beach, diapers, uh, all kinds of things, and leave them on the beach. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have the presence of mind to take them, please have the presence of mind to take them back home. Mm -hmm. Now, I am still hearing why we didn't do anything with the Litter Act. And I said, but listen, I went to Parliament to address that. Is an issue that we need to address again. The Minister of Health can bring that again. Maybe mm -hmm. we need to get we need to get together and go to the, the Minister of Health and say, listen, the Litter Act is important enough you know, that you need to do that. And that is where change is made. That is where law is made. You have now um, all the issues going on with election and who should call election and so on. All these things, the difference between the Constitution and Convention. These are issues that are debated in Parliament and. Um, Antiguans and Barbudans need to know the difference between the constitutional provisions, yeah. the legal provisions, and what people on the outside call convention. You can't take convention to court, it's the constitution and, and law, and that's very important. So I'm very proud of my, my role in parliament. The, the speaker will tell you that if there's parliament, John McGinn is there. <laughs> yeah? And yes. every time I debate, I come prepared with a presentation mm -hmm. and take the time out because that's what the people elected me to do. Honorable John McGinley, you are a candidate for the 2014 elections. How are you feeling and what are your expectations over the next couple of months? Well, I expect to win. Um, <laughs> that is yes. my expectation. No. In 1999, I ran as a candidate and I, I came second. Mm -hmm. um, I've never lost. I came second because uh, there were other people that were in the race that didn't place. The person who won became the representative mm -hmm. and I came second. Um, 
And I woke up the day after the election in 1999 and realized, one, the importance of what I just did, and two, the significance of the decision of the people. Mm -hmm. And never to take that for granted. Never to take that for granted. It's not something you take lightly. When, you, when I lost that election, when I came second in that election. <laughs> you didn't lose. No, when I came second, I, I really realized how important the process is. Yes. And when you go to somebody and say, I would like to represent you in the House of Parliament, it's not something you take lightly. There's a certain expectation, the way you behave and present yourself, mm -hmm. the cer certain things that you do. You, you have to take it seriously. In 2004, I was elected. 2009, I was elected again. Every day, I wake up working hard for the people of St. John's Rural North and Antigua and Barbuda. There, there are many people that say, oh, you know, we see you in Parliament, but we don't see you in the constituency as much. Everybody will find something to make a judgment on. Mm -hmm. I live in St. John's Rural North. I go to the beach in St. John's Rural North. I play tennis in St. John's Rural North. I go to restaurants in St. John's. I'm in, I'm in St. John's Rural North every day. Um, it might not be enough for other people or some people. And some people always have to say, listen, I would have liked to have seen you in my area 20 times a month or 10 times a month. I don't know. But I've always left my home every day to work hard for the people of St. John's Rural North. And I'm going to continue. That is why I've put myself up to be the candidate again. And um, I have asked everybody I meet, I say quite humbly, listen, I would like to be your representative again. I ask you for your support. Uh, I have not done everything right, but I've certainly done a lot of things mm -hmm. in the best interest. Um, I can talk to you about children who have got educational scholarships, people who have helped with work, um, businesses who have helped, uh, people who call me 11 o'clock at night with, with a challenge and, and I've had to get up and, and deal with it. I don't mind that. I, I do that because in politics you meet and you, you, you're, you're faced with certain situations. And I, I'll give you one very quickly. Yeah. There's a young lady named Michelle Jeffrey from Yorks. Years ago, she told me, she said, Mr. McGinley, I'm going to mash up CXE. <laughs> yeah? And I said, yes. oh, pre precocious girl, living at home with a couple of sisters and brothers. A friend of mine had taken her in, and he said, John, this young girl is very bright. Mm -hmm. I said, Listen, if she does well at CXE, I'll get her a scholarship. Yes. And lo and behold, CXE comes back. I think she got 14 ones. Wow. No, no. What am I left to do? I called the university and I said, hey, she's at Icasa now on a full scholarship, wow. following her dream to become a doctor. Those yes. kinds of stories are why I'm in politics. Not yes. some of the craziness that I hear, you know, they say you travel and they, that's nonsense. Mm -hmm. I could travel if I wasn't a minister of government. That's not important to me. Yes. I go and do my work and I come back. What's important is seeing the interaction of young people. Um, I've been in politics you know, 20 years now. So I've seen people who have grown up with me uh, left school, started careers. Now they, they they used to call me Uncle John no? and then Mr. McGinley. Now they call me John. They're big people. And they <laughs> come and sit down and they, they engage in me yes. in serious conversation about um, how young people look at things. Mm -hmm. I, one of the most amazing things for me was I had a conversation with a group of young people. And this issue of homosexuality was up. Uh, I was a minister of health and Yes. Um, the issue of HIV and AIDS and how you deal with men who have sex with men and commercial sex workers. Mm -hmm. These are things that you have to deal with. You can't run away from them. Yes. And I remember when I was in school, if there was a boy in my class or in the school that seemed effeminate, they used to ridicule them and laugh at them. Mm -hmm. The kids nowadays, my, my, my son and his guys, say, listen, what are you wasting time on that for? Those are not the issues of today for us. You have to tell us how we're going to move Antigua forward, 18 and 17, 18. Yeah. Don't worry, those are things that you guys are wasting time on that stuff. You need to come and tell me, how are we going to move forward? How are we going to deal with sustainable energy, yeah. renewable energy? Tell me things that matter to us now. Not, not those things. If you don't have that conversation with young people, yeah. if you don't have an opportunity to talk to them and listen, yeah, you're never going to understand where, where we're going. So. Yeah. Those kinds of conversations, the, the opportunity for, as a politician to go into all kinds of communities. Mm -hmm. um, last Saturday, I, I, I had a, a meet and greet with a Marble Hill. And when you listen to the divergent views of how they see things, yeah, what a rich opportunity to learn and to grow, both for them and for me, because they, they see something through different eyes. Yeah. And you know, I, I look at a picture sometimes. Uh, there was a picture on the internet just recently of a parrot. 
Okay. And then somebody said, but look, it isn't a parrot, it's a woman. And when you look closely, they painted up a woman with her hand. I don't know if any of you have seen it. Painted up a woman, and it looked like a parrot. So okay. unless somebody draws it to your attention, and you look through it through different eyes, you don't yes. see it. And the yes. Politics has provided that opportunity. I've met Barack Obama. I've met Hillary Clinton. I've met prime ministers all over the place. Mm -hmm. But I've also met great sports figures. I've also met people in communities mm -hmm. that, um, you know, that have done tremendous things. But you've, I've met people who have given you more. Uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu. Uh, I, I mean, 2008, I think it was, 2007, as a Minister of Health, I was Chairman of the Commonwealth Ministers of Health. And I was invited to um, present at the Commonwealth Health meeting. But one of the things they gave me an opportunity to do is to work on the agenda. And we had a guest speaker. And they asked me, who would I like to invite? Now, this is the world, the Commonwealth of the, the UK, the Commonwealth grouping. Um, with Australia and all these places. So they had good pull. And on the list of names, I saw ben Desmond Tutu. So I okay. said, let's have Desmond Tutu come. And he came. I got a chance to have dinner with him. And we spent the day together at the meeting. And I got a chance to listen to him talk. One of the things he said to me, he said, John, listen. In life, do not underestimate the value of everybody you meet. Mm -hmm. He goes, I get to talk to kings and queens and prime ministers all over the world. I live in Atlanta. He said, you knew that? I said, no. He goes, I take the train in Atlanta. <laughs> and one day I'm in Atlanta and five people came up to me and started asking me for my autograph. Mm -hmm. And then another lady came over and said, could you sign this for me? As she was walking away, she said, do any of you know who that guy is? They didn't even know who he was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he said, you get an understanding that in this world, you, you might be famous in some places, but you are Desmond Tutu. That's who you are. Yeah. And you always have to remember that. In his speech, he started, and this is health and HIV was big at the time. Yes. And he, he stood up and he said, you know, the Lord came, sent his son to save all of us. Um, gay, lesbian, so-called straight people. And then he said, and even George Bush. <laughs> you know, and I, I said, but, but he can say that. And he yeah. said it with all humbleness. And yes. he said it with, with such caring, you know. He says, listen. We're all here to help everybody. Yes. Don't pick and choose who you're going to help and fight. And these are the kinds of opportunities that, that have made me understand the importance of this thing called representing people. And to be able to sit and talk to everybody. Mm -hmm. And I can disagree with you. That doesn't mean I don't like you. Yes. And you can disagree with me and you shouldn't dislike me because you disagree with True. me. And this is, what, this is what I'm hoping to take to being the representative. Um, the first five years was sort of a blur, a lot of new things. Second five years was a maturity. I've learned a lot. And I think now, um, if I'm given the opportunity again, there's so much more that we can do in bringing people together, working together for the community, and making uh, St. John's Rural North matter. Uh, I've been saying all along, St. John's Rural North matters. Yes. And it is very important area in Antigua and Barbuda. And um, it is important that we have strong representation from this area. Honorable John McGinley, for this segment of Your Right to Know, Our Pleasure to Tell. To wrap it up, um, for today's conversation and for those viewing and listening, um, should the United Progressive Party be re-elected um, for another five years of office, would you like to maintain your role as Minister of Tourism and Civil Aviation, or would you like to undertake a new portfolio? That's a decision of the Prime Minister. Okay. Uh, minister is a title. I am here to serve. If the Prime Minister says to me, none of us came into this with a preconceived idea that you're going to be this or that. Yes. Um, I have said to him, Mr. PM, you, the, the way our constitution says is that the leader of the party that controls the majority in the House of Parliament is invited to be the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. He is the Prime Minister. Yes. When he invites you, it's to work with him. Wherever he wants me to work, I am prepared to work. Yes. I, I'm, I thank him all the time for... Uh, the wonderful opportunity he has provided, and if he wants me to be anything, I'm prepared to do it. Um, I'm pretty sure that there are others in my party that can do a wonderful job as Minister of Tourism, Civil Aviation, mm -hmm. Minister of Health. Wherever the PM wants me to serve, I will serve uh, and go the next day 100% to get the job done. Excellent. Thank you for spending time with us, and for those at home viewing and listening, this is your right to know, our pleasure to tell. I am Malaika Moffat.